Hello, Brent Fikowski here. We're talking about scoring today. I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, there was an article on the Morning Chalk Up. Uh, I'll link it in the, the description of this if you want to go read it. And there's some comments on there. I commented on there. And shout out to Tyler Watkins who made the article and then a user called at RT who made me think about it even more. So I've been thinking about it and I thought, you know what, I should make a video on it. Uh, just to give my two cents on the topic of how to score across the competition, some potential different scoring methods. So I'm going to probably do a two-part video. In this first part, I'm going to talk about what these different scoring systems are and what that would look like functionally in four specific events. And then in the second one, I'm going to give some more in-depth analysis on uh, how that would potentially play out, how athletes would react to that, and then potential pros and cons and pitfalls as far as what I would recommend, I don't even know if I'll really get to that. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But um, I even I did have an event reach out to me and they said, hey, I saw this new scoring system. Um, you know, sh should we do that? What do you think? And I was like, oh man, it's not as easy as just switching scoring systems. There's a lot of things that need to be considered before you just dive into a new scoring system. Um, the, so let's just get into it. So we'll just look at the top here to start. Uh, we've got A1, A2, A3, and they're all very much the same. Uh, I have a, ring light, so you're going to get this circle here, but anyway, uh, influence your life, I guess. A1, A2, A3. So A1 is if you get first place, you get a point. If you get second place, you get two points. If you get three, third place, you get three points, and so on. You see this in the CrossFit Open, which makes sense because there's tens and hundreds of thousands of people all on the same leaderboard, so you need to just rank them as such. And then you even see it in small events uh, with less competitors, such as the World's Strongest Man. So if you win one of the events, you get a point. If you come second, you get two points or three points. So if there's six events and you finish with six points, you won every event and you're going to win the competition. Uh, A2 and A3 are essentially the same, just very small differences. So this year at the CrossFit Games um, 2021, as well as the Rogue Invitational uh, 2021, they use A2. And that is, I mean, it's the same functionally as A1. It just looks different. It just kind of looks a little prettier because someone finishes with 720 points. Whoa, that's a lot of points. Um, and it's like more is better. Um, and every place down the leaderboard in this situation, you go down by the exact same number. So you go down by five points, by five points, by five points. And then the last place you usually gets zero points or, or maybe five points. But for the sake of this, we're going to just say zero. So the, the worst finisher gets zero. In this one, the best finisher gets 100. The worst finisher gets zero but you don't go down in steady increments of, let's call it five, if there's 20 athletes. You go down first by six, then by five, then by five, then by four, then by four, then by four, then by three. And you saw this at the 2016 games, the 2017 games, the 2018 games. So it rewards higher finishes. So you know, getting first place, Compared to second place, you're gonna get like a six point spread. Whereas if you and that same person were just by each other further down the leaderboard, you're only gonna get maybe a three point spread on that same athlete if you just beat them or you just get beat by them. So it rewards higher finishes. Um, whereas the further you place down the leaderboard, it like isn't going to impact your points total quite as much if you place 35th versus 36th. It's just not gonna matter as much as if you know that difference between first and second is, is a lot more important. That's what we typically see in CrossFit competitions. Uh, pretty simple, pretty foolproof. As long as you have a way of determining that person did better than that person, then you just push them into the score symbol. Uh, B1, this is the Z score. So this is what was described in detail uh, on the Morning Chalk Up article, and he has a spreadsheet in there as well that describes it. I'm going to pull up this spreadsheet, uh, it took me back to, I always liked math, um, but it took me back to that, I haven't, I haven't done this type of uh, math in a while, so, you know, I've got this pulled up here, how it works, why don't I just pull this a little closer, shall we, ba -ba -da -ba. production value high, I could do like a screen grab thing here, but you know what, I'm not going to, so anyway, long story short, I'm going to keep this here, well, long story long. Um, you take the average. So this is an event at the Rogue Invitational, event number one, which was uh, mostly rope climbs in a vest, right? So you go down here and the formula finds the average. So the average time of the 20 men was 10 minutes and 54 seconds. The standard deviation is two minutes and 17 seconds. So standard deviation 
is um, it's a formula that basically tells you where most of the scores are relative to the mean, which mean is means the exact same thing as average. So mean is you just add up all the times and then you divide by the number. So you say, okay, we're gonna add up every single time, we're gonna divide it by 20. That's 10 minutes, 54 seconds. Okay, standard deviation. Within two minutes and 17 seconds of that, the average score, that's where you're gonna find the majority of people finish. And so the smaller that number, means the tighter the grouping, closer to that middle time, that average time. Um, yeah, and then the larger that time uh, in the standard deviation, the more spread out the times are. Anyway, needless to say, what it does is it still gives the worst athlete a score of zero. Um, in some cases, maybe like one and a half points, but usually just zero. For the sake of this, I'm just gonna say zero from now on zero, the best person gets 100, and then you are sort of spread out relative to how well you did based on the field. Uh, let me just kind of figure out if I... Yeah, so it determines, like kind of percentage-wise, um, it sort of determines, hold on, percentile based on, yeah. So based on the distribution of scores, it's going to give you, uh, a percentage, a percentile of how kind of far away you were from the average score. And then you change that into the 100 to zero ratio. So for example, Pat Vellner, he won the event, the tippy top there, and he got 89 point, I'll link this spreadsheet as well. He got 89.74, uh, this spreadsheet was done by someone else, wasn't done by me. Um, he was 89.74 percentile away, so then you just change that to 100 and then you know, you use that same formula to change everyone else's score. So, you know, Pat still gets 100 points. Jason Smith still ends up with, you know, zero points essentially. But then down the, down the leaderboard, um, if you have a grouping of athletes that had pretty much the same score, like let's say they're all within like a half a second of each other, instead of here, they're gonna drop down five points, five points, five points with the Z score, they're only gonna drop down by, you know, a, a half a point, right? So that, that sliding to the finish and that separation in a long event when you're only you know, a second or two behind someone, you're not gonna get penalized in the same way. You're not gonna lose those points um, in the same way. So it's all based on the average from the best score to the worst score, everyone in between. And as those scores could potentially change and as the field potentially changes, that whole average and the standard deviation would change and then the spreading of those points would change as well. So we'll get into what that would look like in a few different workouts. But next is percent percentage of first place. This one is simpler to understand. So if, you, if you're not a great math person and maybe I'm not a great explainer, this one here is just simpler. So you just have the best score. So let's say it's someone snatches, you know, 300 pounds at a competition. Um, oh my, I was gonna use the calculator on the damn thing. Um, 300 pounds, so every person you know is going to snatch less than that. So if someone snatches 200 pounds, you just go 200, whoops, 200 divided by 300 equals. So it's all based off of the first place finisher. So once you know the first place, you know that person gets 100, everyone else gets less than that. It's as simple as that. If it's, you know, we're gonna go through this here, but if it's an AMRAP, you know, the best person got 1,000 reps. Wow, that's a lot of reps, good for them. Everyone else is going to, this is an easy one. So if someone gets 650 reps, we know 650 divided by 1,000 is going to be uh, 65 points. And then if someone gets 651 reps, divide that by 1,000, they're gonna get 65.1 points, uh, assuming you do point one, or you could just average it up. And then time works the same way, obviously it's, the other way around where an actual low score is worth more than a high score. So you just convert it to seconds where you can go, all right, you know, someone, you know, did Fran in three minutes all they want, sweet. And then someone did it in 3.30. So three minutes in seconds is 180 seconds, yes. And then 3.30 is 210. So you're just gonna go 180 divided by 210. Um, should know what that is off the top of my head, but it's not coming to me. Pressure. I'll be fine. 
So you get the idea. So percentage base. Now with this, what usually happens, I've spot checked a bunch, and typically, so first place is always 100 points. Last place is usually 60 to 80 points. So you're not gonna see that same kind of point spread. You're not gonna see dudes or chicks uh, end up with zero points if they do bad in an event. It's usually more like 60 to 80 is, is a bad score. Uh, and so people's points groupings might visually appear a little closer than they have in the past. Like at the CrossFit Games, assuming there's no cuts, the, the person who comes last might end the weekend with like 300 points and the winner might end up with like 1,200. It's not gonna look like that. It would look more like, you know, uh, you know, 700 and 1,200, and everyone would be between that. Still be plenty of separation, but it would just appear a little less. Now the last one, I'm not gonna get into this one too deeply. Uh, some people mention this, and it's worth mentioning, um, is a predetermined scoring system like Samalog. They use that, uh, I read about it. Hold on. Should have been using these the whole time. Uh, they were a gift from Reebok, how cool is that? <laughs> anyway, um, great. Predetermined scoring system. Uh, so I believe speed skaters or velodrome cyclists use Samalog, and if they're doing multiple distances, so let's say they have a, you know, a 5K and a 1K and a 10K, in order to add up all their scores and get like a cumulative of who's the best speed skater this weekend, um, you know, you'd go, okay, well, how many seconds did that take? Whatever, 300, I don't know, I'm just putting in numbers now. Um, and then you would divide that by the number of meters. So super simple. Obviously at that point, um, you're always gonna get more points for the 10K because you're going to be going slower over the course of meters per second, but they're basically just finding, you know, what was your meters per second in each of these, and then you just kind of average them out or add them up. Um, and so it's predetermined that we're just going to find your, your speed, like your meters per second, your kilometers per hour, your average pace per, per individual event, and then we're going to add that up, and whoever has the fastest average kilometers per hour over the course of these events. Um, now that scoring system you know, obviously like a meters per second, it, it doesn't make sense in CrossFit, but there's too much variety. Now, what would maybe be closer is the decathlon. So for those of you that don't know, the decathlon is a track and field event, an athletics event, uh, it's done at the Olympics. There are 10 scored events. Um, you know, there's the 400 meter run, the 100 meter run, the one mile run, the javelin, the discus, the hurdles, the long jump, the high jump, uh, two more. Something. Anyway, 10 events. And it's like, okay, well, how do we add up a scoring system for this? So they have a scoring system for this, and they changed, they've changed it a few times. Um, and it's a scoring table, so let me find it here. Um, I'll link this as well in the bottom so you can have a look at it. So this is pretty cool. Um, basically, they just have, so basically they have a 1,200 points. It's like the best you could ever do in every event. So 1,200 points is the holy grail for all 10 events. And then it kind of goes down in these, you know, 50 point jumps, well, really every single meter or every single second. So if it's a high jump, like every centimeter, if it's, you know, a discus every centimeter, if it's a running event, every, you know, half a second or every um, millisecond really is a deduction in a point or a partial point. And they sort of create these, what is 1,200 points? For the sake of simplicity, let's say it's roughly the world record in that event. It isn't for every event, but um, roughly speaking. So for the 100 meter, if you run a 9.5, which you know is like, obviously, uh, yeah, I think that's a world record, um, right at the top there. It's the first event they do that would you know beat Usain Bolt's record. Uh, then you get 1,200 points. You're not going to get that, but let's say you run a 10 flat, 10.00, you would get about 1,000 and. Uh, 90 points, right? So you'd get 1,090 points if you ran 10.00. And then for high jump, you know, if you jumped two meters, you'd get 800 points. And it just kind of goes down the list. And so the athletes know this scoring system, it's predetermined. So they go, you know, before the entire year starts, two years in advance before the competition, 
you know, they're looking at their PRs and training and they're going, okay, like where am I getting the most points? And then how do I distribute my training time to try to increase my points to get as many points as I can, um, you know, across the entire event. Like if I can spend more time on my technique in the discus, I might be able to throw it, you know, an extra few centimeters, which would be a lot of points, but I could spend all the time in the world on the 100 meter and I'd only increase by a little bit. So, you know, all kind of works into that. Um, and the, the table, the scoring table should reflect that at higher levels of performance, a unit gain, such as one millisecond in sprint times, is more significant than at lower levels of performance because of the physiological limitations of the human body. This is important. This is something I'll come back to later when we analyze these scoring systems. So obviously it's a lot easier uh, to take, let's say like a relatively fit 25 year old male, if he can run hundred meters in say 16 seconds, it's relatively easy, not easy, but you can get them to go from 16 to 15 in probably a couple months of just like training twice a week, just teaching the person how to sprint. If they're like relatively fit. Now that's 16 to 15, so that's a one second increment. Uh, to teach someone to go from 10 and a half seconds to nine and a half seconds is, that's a, that's a lifetime of work and potentially impossible even with the most gifted of humans. So it's important that with this sliding scale, um, you're not rewarding every single millisecond exactly the same. As you get further away from that ideal time, uh, you're rewarding less points per millisecond. Does that make sense? Um, you should be able to understand that. And the same could be said for a snatch, right? A 330 pound snatch is more impressive to a 300 pound snatch than a 300 pound snatch is to a 270, than a 270 is to a 240, than a 240 is to a 210. Um, you can train someone to get from 210 to 240, that again is you know relatively fit, healthy individual, whatever, uh, but to go from 300 to 330 or from 330 to 360 is, you know, is not easy and that's, uh, you know, there's become some limitations within the body. So that's one thing with the scoring system with the decathlon. Two, the scores for different events should be comparable in a manner such that equal skill levels in different events are rewarded with equal points, however difficult it is to define such a concept. Um, and again, that's a very eloquent way of saying, you know, if I score 1,090 points for a 10 second run, 1,090 points for javelin, how hard is that? You know, how far is that? And you can do that relatively based on, you know, some world records. You can look at historically um, how far decathletes are throwing the javelin and kind of compare that. But again, super hard to do. Um, and because of the variation in CrossFit events, there's no way you're gonna be able to do this with any sort of accuracy. Um, you know, unless you really, 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 really know the field of athletes you're testing for, like you'd have to know that, say it's the CrossFit Games, you know, 40 men, 40 women, you'd have to know their strengths and weaknesses inside and out. You'd have to test them regularly through things. You'd have to test athletes like them regularly. Uh, and then you probably have to do workouts and tests that have been done for years and years in a row when you start to see trends and you start to see what the limitations are. Um, but because there's even more variation in CrossFit than to the decathlon as far as what is being tested, you're still never going to really know what a field is capable of. So you might say, oh, you know, 12,000 points is the time of four minutes. That's amazing. Well, what happens when someone does it in 358? Um, it's always possible because you never know who you're gonna get at the CrossFit Games. You could get someone who's just crazy good at this thing. All right, so that is part one video. Um, just describing these. Now, I'll take a quick break here and I'm gonna fill in this table. All right, zero seconds YouTube time. Too much time, real time for Brent. But here we are. So these are four workouts I chose. Uh, we got a long workout from the games, short workout from the games, uh, AMRAP from the games to kind of show how the scoring system worked there, and then a one rep max uh, in pounds. So I took the first best score, the fifth best score, and then the worst score for each of these, just to kind of show you what that could kind of play out like on a, like a simplified leaderboard. Um, obviously, you know, it's not like the fifth guy here is the fifth guy here, it's just the, the fifth best score. If you want to see like how it would actually play out, again, I've got the links um, and how you know the leaderboard would shift. But uh, anyway, so obviously the first best score always stays at 100. And then the second best score is 80, 80, 88, 88. And that depends on the depth of the field, how many people there are. The more people they are, there are, the more points you're going to get for fifth place in this uh, system up here. 
and A2 was used at the Games and at the Rogue Invitational, which was like a consistent um, spread of points per finish. There weren't, there were not more points awarded for a higher finish like you saw at the 2018 CrossFit Games. And then the last place finish, I know I keep saying zero points, but uh, it's five, five, eight, and eight, um, whatever, kind of same, same. So Z-score, again, you find the average and then your sort of uh, percentile away from the average and the standard deviation, all kind of blah, blah, blah. So you're gonna get scores here that mimic a lot closer to these scores, right? So it's gonna be a little more palatable and understandable, like, oh, you know, like 1.89, that's pretty much zero, 2.87, 1.33, 0 0.04, those are all like pretty much zero. And then the second places you're getting, sorry, fifth place scores, 85, 85, 86, and 90. And so what you're going to notice, and we're going to get into this in part two, is in this sprint video, in this sprint workout, 90.88, that's a lot of points. Like, that's a pretty good amount of points. Um, you know, and it's, it's like, okay, you know, that's, yeah, it's because it's only a second and a half slower in this sprint. Um, and so you're only going to lose, you know, uh, 10 points. And then where something like the swim, you're losing 14 points for about four minutes and 10 seconds of work. Um, over the course of a longer workout. It still always kind of works out, but it is interesting to see the fifth place finish obviously is, is going to shift more than it is in this system. And then this one here, the worst place obviously is not gonna get zero points. The worst, the worst person in each of these events gets 80, 58, 78, 78. Um, so then the question becomes in this percentile system, you know, do you go, okay, is this, is this score, you know, 58, percent, even though it's 58%, isn't an actual indication of how the percentage, how much worse they are than that person in that event. And the same you could say for these, um, whether or not they are 80, and obviously the pounds is super simple. It's just a percentage of the weight. And again, this was just done by 297 divided by 367. This here is 161 divided by 276. This was converted to seconds. This was converted to seconds and divided. So that's kind of how it looks, how it plays out. Uh, video two, I'll release uh, soon and that will cover um, uh, just some further analysis on what this would actually play out like, what are some pros and cons to each system.